Today's session on the Art of the Deal, we're joined by Josh Braun from uh, Submarine Entertainment. Uh, Josh has been uh, working as a sales rep with a high concentration on docs, although he does fiction films uh, too, uh, for uh, at, at least 10 years, uh, very prominently. Um, and uh, you know, perhaps as a, uh, as a starter, Josh, I could just ask you to, to talk about, you know, historically in the last 10 years, you know, wh how have you seen the doc market evolve, you know, specifically in reference to the films that you've worked on? Um, sure. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, you know, I think uh, at a certain point for me, my just this very brief, brief background is that when I was, I used to work at a company called Fremantle doing te foreign television sales. And at a certain point, which was approximately 1999, I, I was ready to leave. I'd been doing it for over 10 years. And one of the things I wanted to do was to start producing documentaries because I had um, optioned with Fremantle um, the book Easy Riders Raging Bulls and we were developing it as a feature documentary. So I took that project with me and set off to be an independent producer and it was pretty much, it was a short period before I realized that wasn't going to help pay my mortgage. So I veered back into the sales world um, through an association with Micah Green, who was a CAA agent now, but was at one of my competitors, Synetic, uh, another sales company. And we started collaborating, but in, in, in that time, that early days, 2001, 2002, docs hadn't quite, I mean, there was the Michael Moore syndrome of like, yes, that's a doc, but it's all about Michael Moore. It's not about the, you know, the broad category of documentaries. Um, but that collaboration, which was focused only on documentaries, they were selling a lot of big features at the time, but they kind of really, they, I think they brought me on in a way because they saw the documentary space as a space where they wouldn't have to pay me a lot of money because the documentaries didn't sell. So it was sort of um, an opportunity for me to slip in the door. But I was so focused on docs, and in that year before I started with them, I had produced a series for IFC in which I um, convinced um, the host of the show. It was called Split Screen, and it was about independent film. It was a, a, a great long-running series that mainly was featuring short films and segments with, with independent filmmakers. But I convinced him to do a series of mini documentaries in every episode. So that was my sort of Trojan horse way of getting more and more into the doc space. But that led to you know, what I would characterize as the first wave of <clears throat> feature docs that started making money. It was really, the first one for us was Spellbound. That was a, a very, you know, was deemed to be a small film by almost everyone on the team within our own group. But I saw it as potentially a big film. And part of the opportunity for me was that our, our joint venture group said this film is, would be great for the Disney Channel, but it has no legs as a theatrical documentary. And my instinct, you know, which is not always right, but in that case, I felt it proved to be accurate that it would work and it would become something. So when that film hit and after we sold it, it became, you know, At sort of the a- the Toronto International Film Festival. I might add. <laughs> yes, it's true. Many of our greatest triumphs have been at Toronto, many, many of them. Um, so that was like the first period. That was the period there was, there was March of the Penguins. There was other, you know, films that uh, Grizzly Man was maybe a little later, but, um, you know, what I see, and I think maybe the point that maybe I would make is that there's, there's like, there are kind of waves and rhythms of success and failure and the way the industry perceives documentaries. You know, thankfully right now we're in an upswing. You know, when, when 2004 rolled around and we went to Sundance with Control Room and Super Size Me, those were, you know, another wave of films that kind of gave the buying community, the distribution community, um, more reasons to feel comfortable like paying real money to buy feature documentaries. Um, uh, that led to selling a couple films at Sundance in 2007. Uh, My Kid Could Paint That and In the Shadow of the Moon. They were both multi-million dollar sales. They were the biggest sales on the dock side at, that Sundance had ever had. Uh, but both of those films tanked. And that led into also the period of 2008 when the whole financial crisis was emerging. But we actually came to Toronto in 2008 with four feature documentaries, and, and mostly our lineup has been a combination of feature films and docs. In that year, it was almost like a challenge to us. We said, well, you know, buyers were calling us and saying, if you have an all doc slate, don't even call us. Like we just, you know, after the, the way that docs have been performing, it's not gonna work. 
So we came here with Soul Power, Valentino, Food Inc., and Witch Hunt. And you know, in retrospect, all of those films were hugely successful, everyone in their own way, three of them in a theatrical um, venues, and then um, Witch Hunt was a big TV sale, and it launched the MSNBC documentary label at the time. So in a certain sense, that was the, the starting the path back up, which for us led to you know, selling films like Queen of Versailles and Cave of Forgotten Dreams. And, you know, there are blips along the way where, you know, a film that has great expectations um, is not making the money that a distributor thought. But generally, I think what we're seeing now is pretty consistently since 2010, 2011, there's always a few, like, really strong examples of films that were sold in, you know, some kind of heated situation at either Toronto or Sundance entered the marketplace and made a lot of money for a distributor. You know, movies like Queen of Versailles, Searching for Sugar Man, Cave Forgotten Dreams is a huge hit, First Position. Um, so all of these films are things that while, of course, there are many stories of films that didn't make money and were not successful, but from the point of view of, you know, your higher aspirations of what you're trying to do with your films, you know, that's that helps drive the distribution community to feel, okay, you know, 20 Feet from Stardom is a film we sold this year, and that film has done extremely well, and it's another reference point where many of the distributors who saw it said, I mean, it's a great film, but it's, you know, it's, and it's inspiring, and it's a feel-good movie, but I mean, why would, you know, that doesn't seem theatrical, and all those distributors have, you know, come back to me and said, God, were we wrong? It was so s stupid, but, you know, in a sense, it's like, if you're saying all those things to yourself, it's a feel-good film, it's a great, it has great performances, like, those are a lot of the elements, you know, which on a commercial side, you know, obviously, as we all know, there's a broad range of what documentaries can focus on, and that's what's so great about this world that we're all in. But, you know, that seemed like an obvious one to me, but in a, even with that, it wasn't an obvious to every distributor. You know, when, when we're selling these films, you know, cut to now, you know, there's, it's rare that, a film is being pursued by you know five companies. It has happened, notably with uh, Cave of Forgotten Dreams and also the Diana Vreeland film. Um, they're both films that you know had many suitors and uh, a lot of people interested. But often it's you know one or two companies. So it's it's and I think on the you know if you compare that to feature films that are like the hot property, you know, usually when the, you know, the song that saves your life type film comes along, it is gonna be, you know, every company going after it. So it's still a specialized world and, you know, takes care and feeding to, to you know, kind of figure out what to do with these films. I just want to add two footnotes to Josh's career. He uh, licensed a comic book called History of Violence uh, that got turned into a film uh, that he executive produced, and he was once in a band with Madonna. Um, <clears throat> Thank you <laughs> for mentioning that, that I try to keep secret. <laughs> uh, and, and I always try to publicize. <laughs> um, uh, talk to us about the marketplace uh, right now. Um, you, you know, what, what you know, is, you're coming, uh, of some of the titles that you've been attached to at this festival include The Unknown Known, which you really did the deals for a year ago. Um, uh, Dangerous Acts, which you made uh, sale before the festival to HBO. Uh, Finding Vivian Meyer, which you made a sale to before the festival to uh, IFC Films. And uh, you've got The Dog uh, here, which is, is up for sale. And, uh, and, uh, and we look forward to, to hearing news from that. Um, uh, it's, it's kind of a, it's, I think, a fluky year at Toronto this year because a, a lot of these deals got made uh, before the festival for, I think, idiosyncratic reasons that I don't necessarily think represents a trend. I think it just yeah. represents a coincidence. But the, you know, the marketplace right now has these new players um, uh, moving in of all kinds of uh, shapes and sizes. Uh, Vimeo uh, announced um, the, this new initiative um, at the festival this year to uh, this really kind of a, a, probably a different scene than than the distributors that uh, that you deal with, but it's it represents a kind of new force um, uh, in this industry. Uh, Netflix uh, is uh, you know expected to to be talking about uh, new things um, that uh, that they're going to be doing. So what what are the what are those kind of distribution trends that um, 
that uh, you're very mindful of this year? Well, I think actually, to some extent, there is um, there is a link between you know the, our, us pre-selling some of these films and what you're asking about. And I think um, the way I, I I'm seeing it is you know a film like The Unknown Known was a film that we took you know a 29 minute um, initial very um, rudimentary version of of just a segment of the film, and we took it to the Cannes Film Festival last year and pre-sold it. Um, because it needed to go into the financing of the film, and mostly when you're, you know, working on either features or documentaries, it's difficult to sell to pre-sell documentaries. But of course, in this case, it was Errol Morris, and it was a film about a, you know, notorious figure, figure Donald Rumsfeld. So th we deemed it feasible to do pre-sales, but we rarely do. So it, it ended up premiering in Toronto, which was great for us. But that was a sale we did a long time ago with something like Finding Vivian Meyer. That was a real debate with us and the filmmakers. You know, we hadn't been 100% uh, sure if we were going to go, which festival we were going to go to, but we were, um, Tom had gotten the film, and we were, you know, in that period waiting to hear back. And we went to Cannes again, um, and we decided let's show a rough cut of the film. It was very, it was a lot rougher than what you're seeing here. What you're seeing here is, extraordinary and I'm so thrilled about the way the film came out, but it was a little different and not all there yet. But we felt mainly coming, and this is obviously as a sales rep, what you're doing is you're representing the producer and you're representing the financiers. And of course the director and the filmmakers are all part of that mix. But you know, there's always that element of you know you want to be you know fiscally responsible to return the the, the people who as investment made the film happen. Um, so we thought we did at this point we don't know what's going to be in Toronto yet. Um, in hindsight, you know now Tom and I talked the other day saying actually Vivian Meyer probably would have been the kind of film that would trigger a huge bidding war and we would have sold it from a little, maybe not a lot more because we did a deal we're quite happy with, but I think it's, you, you see the landscape and you try to, you know, kind of see what's going to happen. At the point at which we Easy heard, to say that now, but... Uh, yes, exactly. It, it, at the time... It's like a very wise course to... Well, at the time, you know, it, 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 when we decide to show it in Cannes, we also... It's like you're... At that point, you can, you can get offers, but you don't have to take them. You can see what's out there. And so that's kind of what happened. We knew that we could have taken two or three offers. Then when Tom called, you know, we knew we were going to be in Toronto, and that helped us kind of like close the deal with the distributor that came on board, because then they knew there is like a really you know high end platform where the film is going to have a prestigious launch. Um, so it's like it's never a complete science with something like the Dangerous Acts film. We f we were concerned that that might get a little lost because sometimes a film that isn't it has the immediacy of you know a very poppy subject like a photographer whose work was found in a storage bin. It's like a storage war has come to life, where you know something like a you know a protest documentary set in Belarus it doesn't immediately scream you know commercial exploitation. Um, but we knew how good the film was, so it was that that was a real quandary. Um, but a lot of times in our process, because TV is obviously a, 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 a very primary buyer of documentaries, but because we try to find theatrical documentaries that can work in a big way in the theatrical marketplace, we have to sort of have a very frank talk with filmmakers in each case. And that, that film, I felt, could be a theatrical. I think it could work theatrically, absolutely. And seeing it here, you know, you could see that happening, except it's still a challenge. It's like to market that film is a challenge. So we showed the film early to a few TV places thinking if we get really strong interest, then at least we'll know we could, same thing, you know, we don't have to do the deal, but we can do that. So when we showed it to HBO and a few other places, you know, HBO jumped at it, absolutely love it, uh, just fell in love with it and wanted to do the deal and bring it to Toronto. So this is the point at which, you know, we have to decide do we throw the dice and think, okay, we're going to bring the film to Toronto, maybe we'll find a theatrical distributor, but you know, HBO is obviously in many ways uh, among the gold standard uh, possibilities that documentaries um, can end up with. So in the end, we, of course, we went with it because you know, this, it's hard to say no to HBO and at the same time because of what the film is. But I mean, coming back to how I connect out to the, it's, it's because there are so many new players that I think the documentary space 
is getting more competitive. You know, we're, um, you know, Netflix is a major player that's emerging in this space. We're doing a project with them that's going to be announced at a, at a time in the very near future. Um, CNN has emerged as a major financier and buyer of documentaries. Al Jazeera is here and is now buying docs. So there's, and the Vimeo thing you mentioned, which maybe is on a different scale, but it's another opportunity because, you know, while there are a wide range of possibilities, and it's, it's actually great that there's also a wide range of levels and versions of exploitation of any film because for every, you know, story that you hear about, um, you know, whatever it is, the unknown known or 20 feet from stardom, you know, it's these success stories, there are many docs that struggle horribly in the marketplace and those are the things you don't necessarily hear about and we have to be prepared for every possibility when we're selling films. Something I've noticed over the years is, you know, there, there are certain uh, brand name distributors that have been steady at this for a long time, an HBO, a Sony Pictures Classics, an IFC Films, uh, Magnolia, but um, but every year there are new people um, entering th uh, the the marketplace. CNN last year, uh, Netflix uh, this year, uh, Showtime in the last uh, few years it seems to, to my eyes to be uh, more active. And uh, I think what is what's interesting about what you do is that you you kind of dedicate yourself to being aware of all that uh, newcomer activity, whereas uh, a, a filmmaker, and maybe this kind of gets at the, um, the basic question of what does a sales agent do or what, of, what are one of the things a sales agent uh, does, is a filmmaker doesn't have the kind of intel that, uh, that you have to anticipate new, th new things. And it's often those new players who can sometimes strike some of the most interesting deals because they have something to prove to, to get out to the marketplace. They may be untested. You, you, know, you may not know what they're going to do with the film, and uh, you know, we could probably both tick off some stories of people who came and went. Uh, I think of the Oprah Network, uh, for instance, a few years ago that yeah. came in strong, was throwing big parties at film festivals, making big uh, speeches about what they're going to do in the documentary marketplace, and then, uh, and then kind of d didn't follow through for many other uh, reasons that uh, that troubled that network. Uh, but can you talk about, you know, that kind of role of, of newcomer forces? Yeah, I mean, it really is. It's, you know, maybe it's a little bit, I don't know if this is the right way to put it, but, you know, there is obviously, you know, if you're in the business of selling films and you, there's a glimmer of a new buyer, you know, not every new buyer is in this category, but a lot of new buyers tend to actually strategically have to or be willing to spend more to make a splash. So that's a moment that, you know, m me and my competitors who do this, although my competitors who uh, weren't in a band with Madonna obviously don't have the same advantages, but, um, <laughs> uh, you know, this is a world in which these, uh, <laughs> these, it, it's, it's, it becomes a situation where you're recognizing that there's a moment when there's going to be bigger deals, and so everyone kind of like circles, and there's blood in the water. But you know, it's, it's not purely taking advantage. In fact, I think it's actually, it's, it's a symbiotic situation because those companies, be it, you know, Netflix is long established, and they had Red Envelope, and they were very dedicated to documentaries, so they've always been in the doc space. Someone like CNN has been smart about you know making a splash and buying bigger films and associate, uh, associating with bigger filmmakers like Morgan Spurlock and Andrew Rossi and uh, Charles Ferguson. So I think it's like you you want to be in that brand and you make a splash and show the, the the community that you're real. Then you know that as a salesperson, that's what you're waiting for, and it's just happening more and more. You know, the example of OWN, you know, we did deals with OWN and there was that period when they were spending a lot and trying to establish, you know, who knows what happens internally at places where it doesn't totally work and they have to move back to some other strategy. And obviously we hope that these new players that are emerging are going to be maintaining a level of success and commitment to documentaries because it's good, for, you know, for everyone. So, uh one new force is this is uh, the the digital pl uh, platforms and uh, you know before that existed the way deals looked is you'd think about a theatrical and you'd think about a TV and 
you think about where your DVD uh, is going to go. But the, but the digital side of it d d now seems to, even if it's not kind of fully realizing all its potential right now, increasingly, uh, to my eyes, seems to be what people are talking about. Um, can you talk about your strategy when you've got uh, uh, a film? How are you looking to, to you know, divide those rights, or, or are they going with a single player who covers them all? What do they look like? Yeah, I mean, that's part of why, uh, you know, I mean, I always, you know, if, if someone is not going to sign with me, I always encourage them to sign with a rep that understands the space and, you know, can help them navigate because it's a complicated world and the more that rights are being split up, the more that you have to have a kind of strategic overview on, you know, if you put one piece of the puzzle in place, if you're doing sort of an a la carte approach, if you're doing deals with different entities and then you have to retrofit them all together, you know, that's a nightmare. And, you know, in the end, you only would want to do that if you've, that's why, so the, the first starting point for us usually is gonna be that traditional all rights deal. You know, like, for instance, 20 Feet from Stardom, which is a film that sold at Sundance to Radius, the wine scene company, they bought all rights. It's a traditional theatrical release without any day and date VOD. Um, it's been a huge success story. And so that is a model that still works for the right film. But if you're in a situation where those deals, you know, a good reference point for us was this film Chasing Ice. And Chasing Ice was a film that, you know, we went to a festival, launched it, um, had the um, distribution community react, and there were, there were offers, there was interest. But for the filmmakers, and you know, I think many of you maybe can relate to this in the room, in that particular instance, they've been working on this film for six or seven years, and it was a huge commitment in time and energy and part of their life. So when they, you know, some people might say when, you, when you're presented with an all rights deal for you know, $250,000, which would be an advance against your share of the revenues, they would say, that's, it's great, that's, we're happy, that's just North America, we can sell the rest of the world, we'll get our, you know, it's a great starting point, we'll announce that deal and that theatrical positioning will help everywhere. But in this case, it just, you know, and I, I'm not judgmental about it, but these filmmakers were like, is there any other way we can do this? We, we had a bigger vision for the film. And so what we said was, we can try something that's riskier and takes longer, but that would be splitting up all the rights and finding some key partners. Um, and obviously you want those key sort of foundation partners to be you know, big deals, big enough. So in this instance, we, our pitch to the filmmakers was, if we can sell you know, certain rights, perhaps do a direct Netflix deal, which Netflix hadn't been doing a lot of uh, because they like to use aggregators and they're partnered with all of these distributors that we're talking about. So there's only certain times when it really makes sense for them to do a direct deal. But say if we could do that, if there's a TV partner, then we can sort of piece together. So the filmmakers just said, look, you know, this is something where, you know, w that film ties into support groups and NGOs and, and has a lot of um, kind of peripheral support and marketing, which is obviously another area that is super important for certain documentaries that have sort of socially relevant or, you know, that kind of outreach possibility. So they said, you know what, let's go for it. You know, we don't want to take the, you know, two or two or three hundred thousand dollar all rights deal and just hope that it all works and have the, our fate be, you know, mixed in with just this one company that has. So that's a different viewpoint that a lot of filmmakers would have, but that was their viewpoint. So we, that was a great, uh, you know, challenge for us, but we did do a deal, you know, we did a worldwide deal with Netflix and that was early in, in their growth point where they weren't, it, you know, we had done the film Being Elmo as a worldwide deal, and that was the first one that they did, and then the next one that we did with them was Chasing Ice. At the same time, we had done a worldwide National Geographic deal. So those were perfect partners for the film, but they carved out all of the transactional value or a large enough part of it that we couldn't then go back to some of the distributors that were interested in buying all rights and say, well, we sold the TV and there's no Netflix rights available, but we want you to you know, spend $500,000 to release it theatrically and you can hope that you'll recoup the money from some DVD sales and possibly iTunes. You know, obviously some films are huge success stories on iTunes, but that may not be, and it wasn't enough for the distributors to say, okay, we'll take a risk, we still wanna do this even though half the rights are gone. Something you said before is, you know, when a filmmaker can't work with you, and let's face it, you only 
take a couple dozen films a, a year, so, uh, so that's the majority of, of projects. You, you recommend that they work with, uh, with another uh, rep. That, you know, there aren't a lot of good reps um, in this business, and, uh, and there are you know, a few not uh, so good reps uh, in this business. Uh, the, you know, I've heard filmmakers um, give complaints like, I signed with a rep, we went to the festival, it didn't sell out of the festival, and that rep just totally lost interest afterwards. Uh, you know, they moved on to, uh, to other films. Meanwhile, I'm locked into this year-long contract with uh, my rep, and, uh, and uh, 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 nothing's happening, yeah. and I can't get out of it. Um, what are, you know, for, for someone who, who can't work with you and is going out looking for another rep, what are the things that they should be asking a rep, and, yeah. and what are the expectations that, that the filmmakers have? Yeah, no, that's a, actually, it's a great question, because, of course, you know, we want everyone to come to us first as much as possible, and, you know, that does happen a lot because we decided to make documentaries our kind of main priority and a big part of our business plan, but, of course, our volume and our capacity, we're still, you know, the, in the category of, I guess what you'd say, like a boutique sales agency. We have, you know, six or seven people working with us, we can t we take on we pro we sell approximately between 30 and 50 films a year in any given year which is a huge volume of films for even that small enterprise it's a it's a business strategy that we made to keep the overhead low you know honestly work really hard and just you know dedicate ourselves to this and so that's an important thing when you know I, when i was at fremantle one of the things i learned was you know, you just have to keep going. You know, it may be a lot of work, but you can't abandon a film. And that's 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 one. Of, I think one of the more egregious things that can happen in us in a, in a relationship with a sales agent. So I think if you're, I mean, you, the main thing is to do your homework. You know, it's like if we can't sign the film, you know, my some of my competitors who I don't want to steer films to them that I unless I don't want them. But you know, people like Cinetic and Kevin Iwashina and the agencies, they all do documentaries and some of them you know will get docs before we get them and others will you know get docs after we pass on them and then they do well with them or it's just not it's not always like in every single instance it isn't I see this film and I you know the easiest thing that you can possibly imagine is like I saw this film and I hated it like there's no gray area you know but the reality is most films I don't hate and most films are actually quite good and then it's the question of can we, do we totally understand what's gonna happen with it? Do we understand who the buyers are? Do I have an instinct that I know, I've seen this film and I just know in a, in a very kind of instinctive way that I can sell the film? And if I don't feel that way, then there are other reasons. Sometimes we'll take on films that it's a, we, we just try to be on the same page with the producers and the filmmakers so that our expectations are matched. That's one of the most crucial things. So if you've done your homework and you know that the people you're reaching out to are reputable, um, then it's a relationship. You know, it's like you you can't expect, you know, it's a service relationship and I'm here to work for you, but at the same time, you know, I don't like to think of myself as sort of, you know, the maid or the garbage man or the butler, but at the same time, it is that dynamic, but you, it's a little more like you have to treat me nice and you have to treat this, the people that you work with nicely and respectfully and then it's a great experience. I mean, I have such incredible respect and I've become friends with so many of the filmmakers that I've worked with be for the reason that we're on the same page. The minute it devolves into a situation where it's sort of like, why isn't my dry cleaning picked up? You know, then you just feel like you're, you know, I don't feel inspired because it is a collaboration. I think this relationship is a collaboration maybe more than people realize. Uh, so, at the basic, you're looking for uh, filmmakers that have the expectations on the same page and, uh, and respect for the process and aren't crazy. Um, yeah, no crazy. <laughs> or a little crazy. If the film is brilliant, I will tolerate an alarming amount of crazy. <laughs> uh, what are the other things that um, b open up your eyes when a filmmaker comes to you? Like, what are the other things that they can, you know, besides the quality of the film itself, which uh, I assume is paramount, uh, what are the other things that that perk you up? Well, you know, the, obviously, you know, uh, you, you, 
in this day and age, you want to know that maybe the filmmakers have thought about, you know, just simple stuff like a Facebook page or, you know, Twitter account or just ways to connect to potential audiences. If a film has a clear identifiable built-in, like the Vivian Meyer film, you know, her work has been sort of discovered and people fall in love with her work. So as an artist and as a subject of a film, she's already has an identifiable audience that, you know, the filmmakers, you know, have started in a big way to tap into even before they got to, um, you know, launching the film at a festival. So when I hear that, it's like, at least I know they're kind of on the right page and they're being smart about, you know, reaching out and, and understanding what their film is. It's a really crucial point of just, you know, what is your film? Do you really know what it is? Do you have a sense of where it fits in the marketplace? If it's, you know, like a Searching for Sugar Man, which is a film that we sold, it, it's a brilliant film, but if, on the, if you were being pessimistic, you'd say it's a film about an unknown artist who has no catalog, so no distributor can say what they usually say is, well, if it's, if it's a recording artist, how many, you know, albums did they sell? And, you know, in that, I think in the movie, he says they sold seven albums in the North America. <laughs> So it's not going to help me to say seven. Um, so, you know, it's like you have to go on instinct. I mean, the producer was Simon Chin, who we worked with on Project Nim and Man on Wire. So we, you know, it's like it was up to that level of, you know, just filmmaking. Um, uh, but you just have to go on instinct. So I think that's part of, you know, sort of they, they didn't have the expectations that it would win an Oscar and that it would be a huge theatrical success. So we sort of both went in saying, okay, we agree that we all love this film, but you know, what is it? We, all we know is it's a great film and we know that it has the potential to be something that'll affect people emotionally. And so it has elements, even though it's not. Whereas, you know, a very, um, you know, I'm trying to think of a good example of like, um, I mean, even like The Act of Killing, that's a film that I know you're gonna talk about later. You know, you, I remember you called me up and said, you know, it's, it's an amazing film, but it's a tough one. I don't know, it's hard to know what's gonna happen commercially. You know, it has this incredible benefit of Herzog and Errol Morris being involved. But, you know, that's, and who knows? I mean, obviously the film, the filmmaking and what they captured has transcended the fact that, you know, on the surface it may not have seemed to be so commercial. Um, let's uh, bring the lights up and uh, put this out for questions. We've got about uh, 10 minutes or so. So if you've got a question, raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone uh, to you. It's, uh, yeah, right up here, up front. Uh, and if, while someone else is asking a question, if you want to put your hand up, we'll get the other microphone headed your way. Yep. Hi, Josh. Hi. You mentioned in your in your, in your penultimate statements there about how if filmmakers um, have done a little bit of their kind of due diligence and they have uh, their wherewithal and they understand how your function works, that that's, you know, assistive in your process. But I want to know, like, what's too much? Like, because you probably have a bit of a, of a system that you go through and you've got your methodologies and you've got your, your contacts and your network. And what happens when filmmakers get too super savvy and they start kind of dipping into to, to, your, uh, to your flow and your rhythm? Is that like overkill? What do you think about that? Do you mean in terms of the sales process? Yeah, like they're starting to cross right. lines with you, right? And they're starting to mess up your flow. And like you, you say, look, if I, like as you said, I don't want to be th thought of as the butler or as the dry cleaner or as the gopher or whatever. You, you want to be the person who's basically dictating the, the, the captain of the ship, so to speak, on this one. Right. Well, that's interesting. It's true that, you know, there are filmmakers and producers we work with who have been, you know, through this process many times. And so they have their own idea about what should be happening. So sometimes, you know, when... I, you know, I'm not a dictator and I'm very collaborative and I t tend to be very communicative to the point where I'm being very blunt sometimes about what's happening. It's, you know, I've been accused of being almost, you know, too, too harsh in terms of just, but the reality is I feel like we, people, you know, you have to know, it's like, this is what's happening with film. This company passed, they didn't like it, move on, that's it. Um, so... But when there's sometimes filmmakers who have been through it a lot and have a sense of, you know, it happened to us on a film that wasn't a doc, but it's an example. Uh, and, you know, the filmmakers, you know, just were calling distributors kind of without telling me because they knew them and they were friends with them. And, you know, that kind of thing can happen. I mean, we all, you know, it's a small world, the doc world. And so sometimes it's like, it's actually a strategy to be, you know, it's like, don't, 
even pick up the phone. Even if people you know are calling you, they're trying to get information that I don't want them to know, and you think they're your friends, and they may be your friends, but they're trying to figure out what's happening. So at, when I, I think it's important to, if you trust the person who's in charge of selling your film and you want to get the best deal and you believe that they're doing the right thing, then sometimes things like that, you have to just go, go with the program. Basically, if you want somebody to get more involved, you'll say, get more involved, do this and do that. You oh, yeah, like I'll say, like, you know, one of, like with one of our films here, you know, the filmmaker said, oh, well, I am friendly with these distributors. Should I just reach out to them? I was like, yeah, you know, the fact is that this is really tough Toronto. It's a tough year this year because there were so many feature films that were for sale and they were all pro they were programmed all on that same you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday that, you know, for instance, the dog, you know, had a tougher time because it was, you know, premiering the same time as, you know, a, can a song save your life, which every single buyer was going to see that film. So, you know, sometimes the programming is just like, so if, you, if, the, if, if you're friends with the head of Magnolia, you can email and say, look, I know it's a crowded field. If you can make to my movie, I'd really appreciate it. You know, I, you know obviously you can't, you know, it's, you have to kind of decide what the best strategy is. And sometimes I'll just say, don't say a word, that's it, and you know. Here's an element of strategy I want to ask you about, and, uh, and I should preface this by saying that the, 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 there's a book, Spikes, Mikes, Slackers, and Dykes by John Pearson, who is a kind of mentor uh, to you, which talks about some of the, the early days of this kind of uh, repping in, uh, in, the, in the 1990s, and while a lot of the players have changed uh, from the time he wrote that book, some of the uh, strategy is, uh, is still intact. And, and one of the key parts of that strategy in a festival context um, is, you know, is coming into a festival without letting anyone uh, see the film uh, ahead of time. A and uh, every year when our list gets published uh, of what films are in the festival, I get calls from filmmakers saying like, oh, great news, I got a call from uh, distributor X uh, that wants to see my film. Um, and I have to explain to them that Distributor X has an intern who calls every single person uh, who got in the Toronto Film Festival to try to see their film ahead of time. Uh, and that it's not, it, it's something that can undermine uh, a, a sales rep's strategy. So can you talk about that, uh, you know, controlling the information of what gets out about your film? Especially these days, you know, so many people are starting Kickstarter campaigns early, uh, things that are very effective and important to, to grow uh, a film, but what's an effective strategy? I mean, I think, you know, just it, it always is connected to how the film is, you know, being unveiled to the public for the first time and you know, when it's screening. You know, one of the most crucial things for us is looking at the grid. As soon as the grid comes out, you know, do enough of my homework to know that, you know, the three or four films it's playing against are going to be a higher priority or not. You know, if we know that our film is going to be a high priority, then we're a lot more confident in saying, you know, just we don't show anyone early. And it's very rare that we show films early. In the instance of the Vivian Meyer film, you know, it was partly because the filmmakers were really pushing us, and for financial reasons, they wanted to close the deal as soon as possible. Um, but you know, the strategy is something that starts to take shape. You know, and a lot of it is talking to distributors about what the film is. You know, giving them a sense of where it fits in the marketplace, um, figuring out the right things to say to them. Also, being cognizant of their release schedule. You know, if we if we feel like a film is you know, perfect for, you know, IFC or whoever or Draft House or Magnolia, you know, we would say, but we know that they have, you know, three more films this year. They're not so, you know, if we're, if you're meeting with them, don't say, I'm dying for my film to be released by the end of the year. You know, just trying to keep filmmakers cognizant of maybe just some talking points that are very specific to, this is obviously at the point when you already have a distributor interest. But I feel like from the point that the film is announced until we sold it, it's a little like, you know, I always think of it as almost like being strapped onto a roller coaster and, you know, you're, you're on the ride and there's no getting off. And so you have to kind of just be completely focused the whole time and figuring out everything that you can do while you're on this ride within these parameters. We have two more minutes to take one more fast question. I see a hand go up in the back there. If we can get that person a microphone. Hi, Josh. Hi. Um, I want to know, your, there, how do you feel like your business is being influenced by the self-distribution 
business and you you dipping into distribution yourself. So just wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Sure. I mean, I think of self-distribution is, you know, a, there are ranges of ways that that could be interpreted or approached as a filmmaker. And a lot of the times when you're talking about self-distribution, you're really talking about some kind of theatrical self-distribution because the way the companies that, you know, in terms of what you were saying earlier about digital, you know, companies like iTunes and Netflix, you're not going to just walk in the door and sell the film to them or get the film to go through them. So even if you're doing a self-release, you're still going to do deals with companies to have your film available in those outlets through an aggregator company. There are companies that are specifically set up to be able to supply films to those outlets. Um, and I think it connects to you know the splitting up of the rights. If you really are intent on like trying to be in some way a purist about the idea of self-distribution, you know you're probably going to have to reinvent yourself as a distributor and spend you know your days and nights figuring out how to make money from your film. And not everyone can do that or wants to do that. So I think even in the situations where there's some version of self-distribution. Uh, and the, the one, you know, in those versions, it's always like a combination of some traditional deals that happen and some version of, you know, um, putting together like a release plan. I mean, a lot of times we'll say to filmmakers where if an all rights deal is not looking good, but it's clear that a film has ancillary value, we'll say if you can, you know, scrape together, you know, $100,000 or $150,000, um, maybe in a Kickstarter campaign or however you do it, and commit to a theatrical release, then we can take that back to distributors and say, look, I know you didn't want to risk putting up P&A money to release this film theatrically, but now that the filmmakers are doing it, let's do an ancillary deal where, where it's going through their system as a distributor, getting to all you know, the ancillary revenue streams that you need to reach. In those instances, we'll often you know, carve out the traditional TV window and then sell that directly ourselves. But there's a longer conversation about that in terms of how you know, Netflix rights affects the windowing of traditional TV rights, and that gets very complicated. And Netflix is you know, a version of a, a broadcaster almost in terms of the way it's deemed, you know, in terms of how the windows fall. Um, we have to do our uh, breakdown, and Josh, I know you have to run off to a meeting, but I want to thank you very much for coming. We're going to take a 15-minute break, thank and we'll you. be back here at 2.30.